contests. The quintessential way of profiteering from those lonely nights sitting in your bedroom playing video games. Unfortunately, no matter how good you may be, some competitions can sadly never be won. Not from corruption of the hosts, thankfully, but pure, simple ineptitude. Yep, the act of using easy-to-follow rules to reward the best player of their game is too much to ask of these publishers, who managed to completely screw up such a basic notion that resulted in no one physically being able to retain such accolade. So, this episode, we take a look at these silly sweepstakes, these bird-brained bouts, and these moronic matches. As I say... But... Hello, you. I'm Guru Larry, and I welcome you to Fact Hunt. Five terrible video game contests no one could physically win. The long running Oh yeah, I remember that. Sandbox series, Just Cause, had its third entry in 2015, seeing the return of the courageous Rico Rodriguez, once again liberating a heavily oppressed island nation from an evil dictatorship by going around stealing their vehicles and destroying what little possessions they have. What a hero. Anyhow, publishers Square Enix thought these wanton acts of severe property destruction might appeal as an enticement to pre-orderers who may wish to do the same thing legally in real life, when they offered a prize of an entire island to whomever could rack up the highest amount of chaos points within the game. Sounds great, right? Your own private island to relax and socially distance yourself from the rest of humanity? No! Square Enix was not only undecided what island you could actually win, but they couldn't even promise the place would even be inhabitable. Or reachable by boat. It literally could be just a bit of rock sticking out of the sea. And with Square Enix only prepared to invest $50,000 into said island, it probably would have been too. Finally, with the disclaimer, all taxes and fees associated with purchasing and obtaining of Ireland, including to not limited to attorney fees, escrow and closing costs, are the responsibility of the winner. The island's going to be a huge money pit before you even set foot on the place. A prime definition of a poison chalice for the poor sod who would go on to win it. So, who actually did win the competition? Well, no one. Turns out, developer Avalanche Studios did such a lousy job at programming the scoring system in Just Cause 3, the game was rife with hackers and glitches, racking up all manner of impossible numbers, ultimately forcing Squeenix to abandon the contest completely. So, this is an obvious terrible competition. Just Cause, it blatantly is. I'll get me coat. Action 52 may go down in history as the dog ate my homework of angry, sweary game reviewers and containing more crap than a trending page of YouTube, but when you're also asking $200 in 1991 monies for a bunch of barely functioning mini games, then you're going to need to resort to any tactics to convince foolish punters into buying it. And that's exactly what Active Enterprises did when they came up with a genius idea of offering $52,000, yeah, see what you did there, and a scholarship of the same value to the first person who could provide evidence of beating level 6 of the game Ooze by simply taking a photo of the game's completion screen. Unfortunately, no one could actually provide evidence as Ooze was one of the numerous games in the collection that was so poorly programmed that it would either contain a glitch making it impossible to progress any further, or in Ooze's case, just crash completely on the second level. 
So, literally, no one could win the competition, whether they are being lured in by that 52 grand or not. Active Enterprises did manage to fix the bug in the second pressing of the game, making it possible to beat all six levels this time. However, no one could win the competition again, because the game completion screen still doesn't appear if you're playing it legitimately on an official NES. Was it a scam, or just total incompetence for not testing their own game? We may never know. But, whichever way you look at it, Active Enterprises saved themselves $104,000 out of their own ineptitude. If there's anything worse than that we never receive the awesome Pepsi Man in the West, it's the fact that we in the UK only ever had this instead. Mad Mix Game, the Pepsi Challenge. Now, Mad Mix Game, as it was originally named, was an unashamed Spanish clone of everyone's favourite labyrinthine pellet gobbler, Pac-Man. To the point where they couldn't even be asked to change the enemy from ghosts in the game. However, plagiarism aside, the quality was high enough, or more likely the license fee was low enough, for dodgy devs at US Gold to snap up the UK rights to release as a full price title. But no one with a functioning brain was going to pay AAA prices for a Pac-Man knockoff in 1988. So what could the problematic publisher do to fool their customers into paying top whack for a game everyone already owned variants of? multiple times, and usually for free too. Why give a completely unrelated well-known cola beverage some free publicity by creating a mail-away offer that thinly disguises a massive gaming skill contest, rebranding the whole venture as Mad Mix Game The Pepsi Challenge. Now, US Gold cleverly never advertised what the star prize actually was, because there wasn't one. But, according to the promotions, you could win amazing sponsored products such as baseball caps, old crap from other games they had lying around the office, and the holy grail, a Pepsi branded calculator ruler. Ooh. Trust me, that was slightly more impressive in 1988 than it is today. Slightly. Unfortunately, the competition would eventually backfire for US Gold, who weren't expecting such an influx of entries mainly as anyone could legally enter, whether they owned a copy or not. So everyone and their mother was writing in, trying to blag free stuff off them. This ended up forcing US Gold to up the minimum entry score from 20,000 points to 60,000, before ultimately just saying screw it and closing the contest early, removing all mention of the competition from future releases. So, please press F in respect for all the poor souls denied their precious Pepsi branded calculator rulers. Also, the main character is literally called Pepsi Man in this game too, beating the PS1 version by at least 11 years. Thought you'd like me to know that. Don't know why. <laughs> Pepsi for TV game. <laughs> now, as legendary a developer as Rare are, you think they of all people would be competent enough to hold a contest, wouldn't you? But, no. Back in the days when they were known as Ultimate Play the Game, they were predominantly a ZX Spectrum developer. So, to celebrate the development of their first game for the Commodore 64, the staff of Carnath, Ultimate teamed up with gaming magazine Personal Computer Games to offer the prize of a trophy to the first person to not only submit a map of the entire game, but also a walkthrough for it too. Quite a bit of work for a bit of tin, really. It seems a bit naff by today's standards, but there was some accolade to being awarded a trophy by Ultimate. They had previously offered similar tokens to previous games, such as Attic Attack, Knight's Law, and later with Entombed. But there was one tiny little hiccup with the staff of Karnath. 
The game was so balls to the wall hard that no one could actually finish the game. Well, they did, but by the time someone accomplished that, personal computer games had gone bust. On the plus side, the competition was later honoured by C64 magazine Zap64 and was won by teenagers Lead Goldstone and Matt Porter. For all its impressiveness of looking like a curly whirly glued to a log, the trophy didn't last too long, as according to Matt, it partially melted on his parents' windowsill one summer. And all that work Lee and Matt put into drawing the map? Well, Zap64 didn't even bother using theirs in the end either, and just hired artist Oliver Frey to draw the thing instead. But the trophy is apparently lost to time now, so if you ever come across a partially melted trophy with Carnath written on it at a flea market someday, give us a shout, will ya? All but forgotten nowadays, 2005's Advent Rising is pretty much best described as Mass Effect before Mass Effect. But rather than destroy the franchise by desperately appealing to SJWs, they did the total opposite and hired Orson Scott Card to write the thing instead. But with the IP about to become the Star Wars of the noughties, spanning comics, novels, TV shows and even movies, Publisher Majesco decided to entice gamers to jump onto their self-proclaimed Halo but better magnum opus from the ground floor by offering the first 500,000 people who purchased the Xbox version a chance to win a whopping one million dollars. To win this princely sum, all players needed to do was locate a number of hidden symbols spread throughout the game. So, with this huge carrot on a stick, Majesco thought this game would sell like gangbusters. Heck, they were so adamant it was going to be a success, they even claimed the URL adventrilogy.com in preparation of the two inevitable sequels. As hindsight can tell you, no, it was anything but a success. The game received terrible review scores, most complaining the game was a glitchy, buggy mess, and from assets found within the game, had a ton of content cut out in order to reach its May 2005 deadline. Advent Rising ended up selling a paltry 130,000 copies within its lifetime. Now, the big question, who won? Well, despite its poor sales, Majesco were receiving more competition entries than they had actual sales. Not only were pirates entering the competition, they had hacked the game before the title had even been released to locate the symbols, and just spammed entries like no tomorrow. So there was almost no legitimate entries. Majesco, obviously, pulled the competition, stating that there was no technically feasible solution that would allow the contest to continue in a fair and secure manner. Though, that could be more an excuse not to pay the prize, as they were in such a financial mess from Advent Rising bombing, they didn't actually have a million dollars in the bank to reward anyone. Majesco instead offered everyone who had entered the choice of two free games, from either Blood Rain 2, Guilty Gear X2, Psychonauts, Raises Hell, and or Phantom Dust. Surprisingly good games in hindsight, but let's be honest here, even a shed full of copies of Ocarina of Time would never be preferable to receiving a million dollars now, would it? Cancelling both planned sequels, as well as a PSP exclusive prequel, Advent Rising would end up being Majesco's final big budget release, with the game being such a dumpster fire, the company's shareholders would ultimately sue the company for gross mismanagement and all remaining copies of the game ended up being bundled for free with Uwe Boll's terrible horror movie, Seed. So, yeah, if you have to leech off Uwe Boll's fame to shift stock, and even he doesn't want to make a movie of your game, you know you've really screwed up. For an ultra-limited time, pre-order your very own Guru Larry plushie from Makeship.com and you can pretend I'm right there with you saying, 
Hello, you, and giving you utterly pointless trivia about obscure video games. Help support the channel with a Guru Larry plushie. Link in the top comment. Hello, you. Thanks ever so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes. Click on the bell if you already are to make sure you're notified. And be sure to check out my other episodes. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon. But thanks again for watching, and I'll be seeing you next time. Ta-ra for now.